Anya, when a philosopher of biology looks at um, the development of molecular biology, which has been an enormous progress in biology, uh, what, what are the kinds of questions that are asked? And I want to zero in specifically on the, the Cancer Genome Project, because this was a, um, is a major effort uh, to go to a new level of understanding of cancer through molecular biology. Um, so um, there are a variety of questions that philosophers of biology have asked about genetics and molecular biology. Um, what does it mean to say something is a genetic disease? Um, what kind of causal role or distinctive causal role do genes play? Are genes bearers of information? Those are some of the questions that philosophers of molecular biology have asked. Um, and with the completion of the Human Genome Project, um, Subsequent to that, at the National Human Genome Research Institute and the National Institutes of Health, jointly they, they sort of uh, put together a project aimed at sequencing 33 major cancers. That's the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. It started in 2005 and was yeah. wrapped up in about 2015. Um, so there were three to three major cancers that were sequenced. They took samples from, in principle, they hoped to get 500 samples each of each cancer type and subtype. They didn't get that because some of the cancers are relatively rare, um, but they took a sample of healthy tissue in a patient and then a sample of the tumor, and they lined them up, and they found what was genetically distinctive in that cancer cell or cancer cell type. And each one different in the 33 cancers. Each one, yeah. And then they pooled all that data for all the, say, breast cancer individuals or all the people with ALS or all the, I'm not, I'm sorry, all the people with uh, prostate cancer, right? And then they sorted that data to find the most frequent numbers of mutations of specific types mm -hmm. within each of those cancers. And then they published these as sort of um, papers in, in journals like Cell or Nature, um, where they sort of summarized the complete sequence yeah. of each of these cancers. The interesting thing about the Cancer Genome Atlas project is when they started, the technology wasn't quite as sophisticated, sure. and they were still sort of sorting out how to sequence a cancer. Mm -hmm. And it took them about 10 years, ultimately, to figure out how to do it well. And even then, we might have to even go back and resequence some of those mm -hmm. samples and, and do a better job. Um, but the, the sort of complete sequence is based on a, a, a subset of individuals. And um, as cancers are enormously complex, complex and heterogeneous. Um, that's one piece of information we have. Um, and we might need to know more, not just about the genetic variants associated with this or that cancer type and subtype, but also gene expression patterns, epigenetics, right, right. Um, where these, these are things to do with not the, the sort of uh, the basic foundational level of the sort of causal determinants, but how they're expressed, when they're expressed, what kinds of interactions there are. So how do you do that? Because then, then, then that adds double and triple levels of complexity on top of the original one. So you have 33 cancers, subdivisions within them, uh, you get the sequence, but then how, how do you deal with the ep, ep, uh, epigenetic issues? So my understanding is that's the sort of next generation oh. of the Cancer Genome Atlas project is so when Obama stood up and, and gave his uh, State yeah. of the Union address and, and both um, sides of the aisle applauded yeah. at the right drug at the right time to each patient, the yeah. Precision Medicine Initiative, a big portion of that was directed towards the next generation subsequent to the completion of the Cancer Genome yeah. Atlas project, which is aimed at transcriptomics and epigenomics. So that is not just the genomic features of cancers, but how and when these genetic features are expressed. Mm -hmm. And um, so it turns out having the alphabet isn't enough. We need to learn how to read it. Yeah. And that can be really important in determining how cancers are likely to progress and what kind of drugs we ought to give. And, and so then on top of that, you would layer uh, data on, on tr treatments of those cancers with some historical data and to try to classify that. I mean, it's fearsomely complex, obviously. It is enormously complex, and, and there are um, groups of people trying to sort of amass that data and keep track of which patients respond well to which drugs, 
and sort of link that up nicely with that kinds of information so that we have something like algorithmic predictors mm -hmm. for what kind of drugs to give which patients. But it turns out just as of now, the vast majority of cancers are still treated with many chemotherapies that were developed in the 1970s yeah. and 80s. So it turns out that you know we have a lot of really good drugs for the vast majority of cancers. The number of individuals who are effectively treated by some of these new precision medicines is a relatively small proportion of all cancers. And so. why, is that a matter of, uh, of cost and availability, or is that a matter of just that it, it's not that a, a, effective compared to the generic uh, chemotherapies? Um, well, a lot of the standard chemotherapies are really pretty effective. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, Kids who might have died from leukemia um, 50 years ago are doing really, really well and living quite, you know, so the chemotherapies are great and they are less costly. Um, so some of these new targeted therapies are incredibly yeah, expensive sure. um, per dose. You're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, so they might not be as widely available, but also they are for very specific subsets of individuals who have particular genetic features. And so being able to ha provide the right drug to the right person at the right time really does depend on being able to sort amongst individuals. So you as a philosopher, as you're following the development in the Cancer Genome Project and then its, its subsequent generations, mm -hmm. uh, uh, are, are you doing that and following the data and then asking questions and, or posing questions, publishing papers to, to um, make the, the way of thinking and the application of that more effective? Yeah, so the kinds of questions that I ask are the annoying philosophical questions like, how do you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so what, what counts as good or good enough evidence? But also the questions like, how are our values influencing our choices? Oh, that's important. Yeah. And what, what are some values that you use? So do you want to be more or less aggressive? Um, in your intervention. Um, so if a patient is in their 80s and this is their third round of cancer and they've already received multiple rounds of treatment for earlier cancers, uh, do they want to make an aggressive choice and take the most aggressive drug or do they want to spend more time with their grandchildren? Because mm -hmm. there's sometimes a quality of life sure. versus a, a quantity of life mm -hmm. issue there and those are hard individual decisions that I, I think can't be made by computer algorithms mm -hmm. or AI. They have to be made with patients and physicians based on their individual um, values and preferences.